Hello, folks. It's what you've waited five months for. Season five of Kenny's Two Pennies starts now. The first point I'd like to make is it's that time of year again, Orange fans. It's time for the gridiron to go back up there for the, all the Orange fans in New York and all around the United States. It's season four of Doug Marone's turn as the coach of the Orange football team. Thing is, this could be his most challenging year yet as the coach for the Orange. The schedule makers didn't do Marone much good. Of course, you're going to wonder if Marone's got the Maronis, if you know what I mean. Look at the non-conference schedule for Syracuse this year. Two Big Ten teams, although they are in the lower echelon. Minnesota and Northwestern isn't much of a cakewalk either. It's a good test. And look at the Big 12. Missouri on the schedule for the Orange. And that's not much of a cakewalk either. Missouri definitely has the goods to beat the Orange. And also, let's look at the big boy on the schedule. And by the big boy, I mean arguably the number one preseason team in college football. USC who supposedly is a home game, if you consider going down to the Meadowlands home. What's with those California boys? Don't they want to come up to the Carrier Dome? Oh, must be they saw what Kobayashi did at the State Fair, eating all them hot dogs. You know, he gave Hoffman's a good national name. He looked like the Tasmanian Devil. Boy, hot dog, good. Yeah, if not for that distended stomach. (laughs) The only one that looks winnable of these non-conference games, one that looks like a sure win, and even that's a question mark, is Stony Brook, the FCS team on the schedule for the Orange. And even then that's a question mark, because Stony Brook is one of the top teams in the FCS. And you know how the Orange have been the last few years against the FCS. I've been kind of doing this on, on my head, you know. As you gotta wonder, shouldn't Division I teams cre- cream FCS teams? Pardon my little hiccup there. Shouldn't they cream them? Yeah, well, the Orange have always gotta let that FCS team score some points, make it interesting. And of course, this is our swan song in the Big East. And of course, we welcome back our old pals from Philadelphia, Temple, to back into the Big East. Albeit, this may be the only year that we play Temple for a while before we head off to greener pastures in the ACC. Hold on, what kind of rivals do we have in the ACC? Oh yeah, we got Boston College, we got Maryland, who I think we should have had a series with all along. Same thing with Boston College. But what else have we got? All in all, this is a year for Doug to show his Maronis and see how far the Orange have come. Me and others think that the Orange is maybe an upset or two away from making it to a bowl game, but I kind of think we may just come up short of 500, even though Ryan Nassib and... Others have got some playmakers there on both offense and defense now. But this is going to be a year where Doug shows his Maronis, if you know what I mean. That's my first point. My second point, what's going on with this door there for the Buffalo Bills quarterbacks? When the last season ended, Fitzpatrick, of course, was the starter. Tyler Digpen was the backup. And Brad Smith, who's a backup wide receiver, was the third quarterback. And what do the Bills do in the offseason? Of course, they had the big name sign on defense. Mario Williams, the first $100 million man to play for the Bills. Anderson there on defense. 
Plus, also, we go out and sign uh, Vince Young, a former hero for Texas, who has done nothing but be a hero in the NFL. In fact, he's been a bum, if you want to throw boxing terms into it. Young goes, comes in, and it's a full-blown quarterback uh, derby. And, of course, in the last couple, three weeks, during the first couple, three weeks of the preseason, what has Thigpen and Young done? Not much. And then a couple days ago, they spring a trade with Seattle. They trade a draft pick for Tarvaris Jackson. And what happens? Vince Young, bye-bye. Vince Young, you're a bust. What have you done besides be a hero at Texas? Nothing. And you gotta wonder, Buffalo may have the goods now to make a run for the playoffs. They're pretty high on this Bills team. But let's stop this revolving door at quarterback. With Tarvaris Jackson now maybe the backup for Ryan Fitzpatrick, it's probably bye-bye Tyler Thigpen. And being from Coastal Carolina University, as your former coach said, Meow! You know some thick pen? We gotta have more dogs. You know, we gotta have more dogs. Meow! You gotta have more dogs, thick pen. I taught you more than that. Of course, Bennett lost his job as Coastal Carolina coach last year. Now I think he's the athletic director somewhere. But stop this door here, Bills. <clears throat> Point number three, and this is a little bit of a new feature this year. Not only am I going to talk about the Orange and the Bills, I'll have a few current events for you. First, I'd like to talk about our annual get-together around Labor Day weekend here in Seneca Falls, the St. Anthony's Italian Festival. It was started with great intentions back in 1981, as everybody knew the uh, uh, earthquake that hit southern Italy in 1980 that caused all that destruction, especially to a, a great, great church there. And all the proceeds from the St. Anthony Festival helped this church. And in, in that area, a lot of the immigrants that came to Seneca Falls from Italy, a lot of the ancestors resided around that area. And it is a great cause, and it is a wonderful festival, and it has grown in popularity pretty much every year but there's one thing you know the Italians up here in central New York and around Seneca Falls they are a great bunch of people and we have class I mean I I can say that the thing is I'm not Italian but I feel like one because I've been around them all my life but at least we got class up here rather than Jersey Shore as you know, back when the St. Anthony Festival started, we have, two, we have two clubs here for the Italians in Seneca Falls, Rumseyville and SMS. They finally put their heads together, and of course, it sounded pretty good. And what do you get when you take two of those Italians on Jersey Shore and put their heads together? A big hollow echo <laughs> that you can hear all the way up here in central New York. As you know, nobody wants to know about Snooky's baby, Lorenzo. Nobody wants to hear about JWoww. Nobody wants to hear about all the others. And you know what the situation is. You guys don't don't count. And you gotta have more respect for your uh, people of your uh, nationality. Don't use that disparaging term, Snooky. Because you know what I want to do? I want to bop you on the head with the nearest heavy object, a la Caveman. <clears throat> Point number four I like to make. It's time to say bye-bye to the egomaniacs of the NFL. Because look what's happened this offseason. T.O., he tried to get back in shape. He got signed by Seattle. Makes a, an appearance with Seattle in their exhibition game. And what does he do? Get open, but drop four passes. So what happens? Bye-bye, T.O. You're going by way of your alter ego there, Unnecessary Roughness, Terrence King. And also, good old Chad Johnson, who decided to revert back from Ocho Cinco. 
What made him think of Ocho Cinco anyway? He's not Spanish, although that's what his uniform number was translated. He decides this year to go back to Johnson. He gets signed by Miami, and what does he do? Screws it up for playing a batting practice with his wife, who uh, I guess has subsequently filed for divorce. Not good going. And also, Vince Young. Although it's hard to call Vince Young an egomaniac. He hasn't made the most of his opportunities with the NFL. Look what he's done with Tennessee. Look what he's done with Philadelphia. And now look what he's done with Buffalo. He screwed that all up. And Goodell and the NFL have sent you guys a message. You egomaniacs, you have no place in the NFL. And you know what? The thing is, you need an attitude adjustment, and I got just the thing. Here's Mr. Frying Pan! (laughs) Last but not least, point number five I'd like to make, Prince Harry. What are you thinking, you redhead? Thing is, during the Olympics, you had become the epitome of class for the royal family. And especially last year when your brother got married. You were the epitome of class. And look what you go and do in Las Vegas. You're supposed to be a British, you're a British royal, and you're supposed to show how nice and cordial that the family is. You're supposed to show how prim and proper British royalty is. And what do you do? Play strip poker, or strip pool, or whatever the hell it is. And everybody sees you in your birthday suit, thanks to someone putting a phone in there. Click. If I saw that, I'd just be like, "Uh, uh," much like Lurch. But what's going on, Prince Harry? I know you're supposedly the clown prince, pun intended, of your family. But you gotta know when to say enough is enough. Heck. Your grandfather, at 90, 91 years old, still is a great person, even if at times he said something that he shouldn't. I mean, he's been through a few health problems the last year, and he still is a spry person. Spry person, pardon my French. Prince Philip, you are one class act. You represent that uh, royal family pretty good. But you gotta have a talk with your grandson. He's got to get it together. And even though I had a few hiccups on this first show, I'm going to get together for this next season. Welcome back, fans. I'm Ken Haas. That's my stories for this week. Be here, here next week when I start to really talk about the Bills and current events.